<clears throat> well, um, aloha, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the Whitney Marine Laboratory. Uh, Happy New Year. This is the first uh, the, of the 2016 spring seminar series, and you're uh, lucky to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Martindale. I work here at the Whitney Lab, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. But before I do so, I just want to remind you that we have these every month, and I think that there was an advertisement for next month's speaker, uh, Akiko, who's, uh, Akito, who's a uh, University of Florida faculty member at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And uh, he is a butterfly moth guy, and he has a very interesting story about how moths will jam the, the sonar of bats that normally eat these things. So I think you'll find that a very interesting topic, uh, and I encourage you to come out next month so we can uh, um, see you again next month. Today, Judith Milkarski is here um, to talk to us about, oh, there he is, um, <clears throat> about uh, an important um, event or uh, uh, issue in our local environment. Um, she is a local Floridian growing up somewhere around uh, the Orlando area. Uh, did her uh, undergraduate at Auburn and took her vet uh, degree in, in Gainesville, so she's a Gator. Uh, yeah, lucky for us. So, um, um, But you know what, the thing that's really interesting about it is she's run a small uh, animal vet uh, uh, business in the Daytona area for the last 15 or 20 years, something like that. And um, she makes house calls, which I think is kind of interesting for, uh, for a veterinarian. But many of us think about um, how the environment uh, is affecting our pets and our domesticated animals and things like that. But very few people, I think, really think about what the role of domesticated animals has on our environment. And this was kind of an issue that was um, you know, brought to mind several years ago uh, when there was a massive die-off of sea lions uh, and, uh, and marine mammals on the west coast of California. And it turns out it was traced back to a, a disease called toxoplasmosis uh, that was uh, originated from landfills uh, from cat boxes. And um, so then you start to think about, okay, what is the role of these domesticated animals, animals have in our environment? And in fact, what kind of role might they be having on us? And uh, we are very lucky because Judith is an expert in this area. Uh, she has started her own citizen science research programs in the area recently, which I think you might uh, learn more about this evening. And I think it's a really uh, important uh, topic and subject, and I'm thrilled to be here to listen to it myself, and I will hope you will uh, join me in welcoming Judith this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martindale. When I was preparing this presentation, I asked for input. And more than one person advised me to progress with humor, which is a problem for me. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I am seriously not funny. And tonight, I am mad. Mad as an angry, because physicians at Johns Hopkins believe that a parasite found in cat poop is making people mad, mad as in insane. And the parasite I am talking about is called Toxoplasma gondii. How many people were aware of this parasite before they came here tonight? Oh yes, thank you. Okay, Would you mi I'm trying to make you all experts on this in the next hour. Would you mind at least saying these, some of these words with me so that they're familiar to you? Can we say Toxoplasma? Thank you. Gondii. Thank you. Um, there is only one genus and species of this parasite. Many strains, but only one genus and species. And it comes in three forms. The form up here on the left is called oosis. Can you say that with me? Oosis. Thank you. Those, that's the form that's in cat feces. And by cat, I mean anything in order felidae. House cat, bobcat, puma, Eurasian lynx. All of the cats can carry this form in their intestines. This is the result of sexual reproduction in the cat intestine. The other forms up here on, on this side, tachyzoites. Can you say that with me? Thank you. That me tachy means fast. That's the rapidly dividing form. This is in um, what's in our system for about the first two weeks when we get infected, and this is the stage that we can affect with antibiotics. Below that is the Bradyzoite. Can you say that with me? 
thank you. Brady means slow. That's the slowly reproducing form. So the tachyzoites convert to bradyzoites and back and forth. Um, there's about two to 2,000 bradyzoites within cysts, within our tissues. If you are an endotherm, if you have warm blood, if you have feathers or fur, you can be infected with toxoplasma. That includes humans. Cats can get all three forms. All the rest of us with feathers and fur only get these other two. Does that make sense to everybody? And with regard to the bradyzoites, the form on the left is what it looks like without a stain, and the part on the right is what it looks like with a stain. Everybody with me so far? Okay, very good. All right, let's see. All right, let's talk about how the cats get infected. The cats get infected when they eat something that has bradyzoite cysts in it. Okay, what do we have here? We have a house kitty, okay? And what has he done? He has killed a bird. Now, one thing this proves, that this cats that are well-fed, we know he's well-fed, he's got a nice little kitty tummy on him. Okay, cats that are well-fed still hunt. It is their nature, it is their ethos. He eats the bradyzoite cysts. Now, please note that this kitty has been vaccinated against rabies. We know that because he's sporting a rabies tag. Vaccination against rabies does not prevent cats from killing birds, and rabies vaccines do not prevent cats from getting infected with toxoplasma, and neither does wearing a flea collar. Okay. She laughed. Maybe now I'm funny. Okay, so... <laughs> in the... Um, I want you to think of the cat intestine as being an oocyst factory. And I'm keeping these little icons here to, so we keep track of what phase of the parasite is where, okay? So on the upper left is what it looks like when a cat intestine, and by that I mean the small intestine, not the stomach, that's a different part, right, of the digestive tract, in the small intestine, the part that digests and absorbs our nutrients. Okay, in the small intestine of the cat, that's where these oocysts form. Bottom right, that is what a normal cat intestine looks like. Okay, for grins, I took the feces of a cat that was known to me, that was a strictly indoor cat that was on a prepared diet, commercial diet, and I took those feces out of the litter box and I put them outside. I did check to make sure they didn't have parasites just to be on the safe side. And I put them outside just to plot the disintegration of feces in the environment. Okay. Upper left, that's what it looks like, right? When it first comes out of the kitty and is in the litter box. Okay, note the little oocyst icon here, okay? Because if this had been infected with oocyst, this is what we would be seeing in the environment. Okay, next one is at 24 hours. Up here, top right, is what it looked like after a week. Please note that by two weeks, I had to go to macro. Three weeks. Four weeks over here. Four and a half weeks, you can see my shoe. I, I noted it with a little yard flag, okay? Out by five weeks. By six weeks, you, you couldn't even tell if you were down on the ground. But those oocysts, those are infectious in the environment for at least 18 months. Okay, this is why we're worried about this. Statistically, one in 110 people has schizophrenia. This is the most devastating of the mental illnesses, the hallmark of which is hearing voices. Now, we have students here from three different high schools tonight. Um, Spruce Creek High School, the senior class, has 593 students in it. Flagler Palm Coast has 500. Matanzas has about half that. Statistically, we can expect that the future will hold that 12 students from the senior classes of those three high schools will eventually develop schizophrenia. If they are men, they'll start to develop symptoms somewhere between 17 and 24, the women a little later, between 22 and 35. Okay, here's what we're worried about. This parasite increases the risk of developing schizophrenia. Now, it is possible that you can be positive for toxoplasma and not develop schizophrenia. Everybody with me on that? Okay. But if you have toxoplasmosis, the risk of schizophrenia increases. Now, I was involved with feral cats and rabies as a part of a four veterinarian committee in Volusia County going back over a decade ago. Rabies was my wheelhouse. Rabies was my comfort zone. In order to enter the dialogue on toxoplasma and schizophrenia, I had to convince myself of several things, and I'm gonna give you a couple minutes with this. Can you read this okay?
Is everybody with me? Can I go on? Okay. I was able to answer yes to all three of these questions, and here's why. Let me get you oriented here. This is a map of unincorporated Port Orange off of Tomoka Farms Road. Now, toxoplasma is something that does occur in cats. It's not the first thing we look for. I test a couple of cats every year. I have tested a cat positive in my practice in, in, since I have been practicing in Volusia County. And that kitty was, was off of Tomoka Farms Road in 1999. In 2004, June, July, and August, this portion of the county had the only three cases of rabies in Volusia County. And this yellow circle here, we were plotting abuse of county-funded animal programs with cats. So at least in my mind, okay, the one case I had of toxoplasma, I could equate with rabies. Moving on. In incorporated Port Orange, off of Herbert and Clyde Morris, right across the street from Silver Sands Middle School. If you remember in late spring 2012, the name James Lee Maxwell, this is the person who was killing prostitutes and burying him, them in his backyard. Within a month of that discovery, there was on the same block a rabies case. I knew about that case because I'm the one who decapitated the raccoon and sent it for testing. So I could say, okay, I, you know, I can't, I'm a veterinarian. I don't diagnose humans with anything, okay, especially not mental illness. But I do recognize that the 50 to 80 percent of the people who are incarcerated in this country suffer from mental illness. So while I can't say that this person have mental illness, I could at least say, well, there was atypical behavior. Perhaps there was mental illness. Does that make sense? Okay. There are more people in this country in jail with mental illness than there are people in this country in the mental health institutions. Okay. Let me give you the scenario. It is a Friday night at 10 minutes after 6 o'clock in the evening in August. The next week, school starts. And I am in a client's kitchen, and I have just finished the vaccinations and exams for her cats, and I'm documenting, doing my little kitty diatribe in the record. And thy client is an elementary school teacher. And she's telling me about all the things that the teachers have to do to get ready for the school year, including finding out where the registered sex offenders are for the neighborhoods that their students are coming from. And I was like, wow, not in my job description. So then she mentions this neighborhood off of LPGA 11th Street and Nova in unincorporated Volusia. And, and that's when I stopped writing in the record and I said, what? What my client didn't know was that as a group of veterinarians, we had plotted abuse of county-funded animal programs with cats. And that neighborhood stuck out for two reasons. Number one, it had the highest concentration of program abuse. And number two, it was the only concentration of abusers that did not occur on a golf course. Okay, I'm get you oriented here. Those red dots, those are rabies cases. The yellow dots are people who abuse county-funded animal programs with cats, and that star is Hearst Elementary School. I'm sorry. Okay, abuse of taxpayer funds. So the county had a program where they were taxing the rabies tags, and they were using the rabies tag tax to fund spay and neuters of animals. So what we were doing was to say, who was abusing those funds by getting more cats than you were even allowed to have in your home? So at the time that we ran the public records request, you were only allowed to have four animals in your house. If you got paid or reimbursed for getting five or more cats rebated in a 24-month period, that, that tipped our record for abuse. Now, you could have been getting two cats a year on sequential years. That's abuse, but that didn't, wasn't our threshold. We only used one threshold for abuse. Does that make sense? You could have had four cats on alternate years, and that wasn't our threshold. So we only used one. Uh, question? So the abuse of threshold... The threshold was you were only allowed to have four animals in your household, period. If you were getting rebated or paid to get five or more cats spayed or neutered in a 24-month period, that was our threshold for program abuse. So in other words, you were, getting, you were getting reimbursed to having more cats spayed or neutered than you were even allowed to have in your home. Does that make sense now? Okay, cool. Okay, so if we superimpose those two, this is what we came up with. Now, this was disturbing. Now, one could argue you were, in theory, you were supposed to have a financial requirement in order to qualify for the spay-neuter rebate program. 
And one could argue that if you are a registered sex offender, you're going to have a hard time getting a job, right? You're not going to have an easy time going up the socioeconomic ladder. And maybe that was the link. But whatever the link was, what they're the children at Walter Hearst are now going to another school off of LPGA. The county is contemplating using the campus as an assistance center for a particular type of family. And that family is single moms with little children and tiny babies. There's a, there's a concept called environmental justice, which talks about fair and equal distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. This is an unfair environmental burden on what I will argue is the most vulnerable family unit in our society, single moms with their little children and their tiny babies. Has anybody heard this, this term before, One Health? I know Dr. Duma has. This concept says we can't get the animal, keep the people healthy for diseases that they share with animals until we can first make the animals healthy. Does that make sense? Okay, let me, let me just take a step back here and talk about society's approach to serious mental illness. Because we're hearing a lot about that in the, in the news lately. Unless and until we as a society can start addressing diseases of the brain with the same compassion and care and concern as we would address diseases with the body, we're not going to get anywhere with this. Let me take diabetes as an example. People who have diabetes have a tendency to experience highs and lows of blood sugar, and that can alter mental status. I have heard people refer to the mentally ill just in the last few weeks on the news as nut jobs and wackos. If I referred to someone who was diabetic and who was having altered mental status, if I said that that person was a nut job, you wouldn't think very kind thoughts of me. Let me take cancer as another example. Cancer in the brain, whether it's primary or metastasized from some part of the body, can alter mental status. It can make a person behave abnormally. But if I said that a person who had a brain tumor was a nut job, you wouldn't think very kindly of me. Okay, let's talk about the ways that humans can get infected with this parasite. Most people know this parasite is the reason that pregnant women should not clean litter boxes. Okay, it takes three to five days for the parasite to become infectious. If you're cleaning the litter box out every 24 hours, okay, we're at least gonna get a handle on that part of it. Another way that you can get it is from eating undercooked meat. You have to cook your meat to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 degrees C, which is well done. The other way you can get it is, is pregnant mamas can pass it on to their unborn baby in utero. And I have put the oocyst, the bradyzoite, and the tachyzoite. Does this make any sense? Okay. 50% of people who get infected with this parasite never knew that they were infected in the first place. 25%, oh, they may have a little fever, joints may ache, lymph nodes may be a little involved for you know, a couple days, a couple weeks, like you would feel if they had the flu. Only 25% of people ever get sick enough to go to the doctor. Now, a lot of talk is being made in feral cat activist circles that a minority of people get sick with this. Well, get sick on initial infection. How you, how you feel or don't feel when you're initially infected with this has absolutely no bearing on what's going to happen to you in the future with this parasite. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. If we take a step back for a minute and forget all the awful things that this parasite can do and just look at it as, as from a parasite point of view, this is a really cool organism. It takes 26 seconds for this parasite to infect a cell, and it can infect any cell in your body except your red blood cells. It has to have a nucleus in order to infect. And where it goes in your body is wherever the blood or the lymphatic system may take it. So your eyes, your brain, your liver, your intestine, your lungs, wherever it happens to end up. And it may or may not cause a problem in the future. On the right, okay, is what it looks like. What it does is it takes this, the host cytoplasm with it, like the ultimate cloaking device. Is that cool or what? All right. I want to introduce the term titer, T-I-T-E-R. Can you say that with me? Thank you. It's an antibody level. It means how far out can I dilute your serum and still detect antibodies? So in fourth grade, we're taught about fractions, right? And a quarter is, is more than a tenth. Well, this is the one for example where a tenth is actually more than a quarter. Okay, and what we're looking for are the Bradyzoite cysts. If you have Bradyzoite cysts in your body, 
then you have antibodies. If you have antibodies, then you have bradyzoite cysts somewhere. You have been exposed. You have been infected. Does that make sense? Seven to 20 percent of people in the United States have been exposed, have antibodies to this parasite. Okay. This is society's approach to the feces of owned dogs. What I'm dealing with are the feces of unowned cats. Ms. Grosso, can I have some help? If you could pass those out, please. I'm going to pass around models. This is a size, weight, volume model. Okay, this is made of home prepared modeling clay. Okay, there's nothing yucky in these bags. But I want to give you a tactile sense. A single feral cat will deposit 2.6 pounds of feces in the environment per month. I'm not going to pass this one around, I'm just going to show it to you. That translates to 32 pounds of feces per feral cat per year in the environment. Okay, how many feral cats do we have? Average nine point, estimated 9.6 million owned cats in the state of Florida, and they estimate an equal number, 9.6 million feral cats in the state of Florida. That's a lot of cat poop. Everybody with me? All right. Okay, let's talk about these oocysts. You can get them from the litter box, you can, if the cat's eating raw things. You can get them from your garden. There is nothing like fresh tilled earth that makes a cat want to go poop, okay? That's called a substrate preference. Those of you who are gardening in areas that the cats are using as a latrine, if you're not wearing gloves, the amount of soil that you can get under a single fingernail can contain 100 oocysts. It takes one single oocyst to infect a human. Golf courses. To a feral cat, a golf course sand trap is the most magnificent of all litter boxes. The next time you see a golfer take a swing whoosh, and kick up dirt, these oocysts can be inhaled. Okay, there's a special niche of feral cat activism, and it's called Making Cats Barn Cats. And the problem with that is what's behind the barn door? Well, what's behind the barn is what we eat. This is a graphic representation of how likely you are to get infected with Toxoplasma gondii by eating respective animal meat if you don't cook it thoroughly enough. And I've, I've put the Brady Zoite cis icon down there to remind us what we're doing. And down here in, in the lower left corner, I have made that little kitty as close to poop brown in color as I could to remind us, because what's happening? The cats are out there eating the mice and rats, right? They're doing their cat thing. They're pooping in the hay. The animals we eat are eating the hay, and then we eat the animals. Do you see how the life cycle gets completed there? Okay. All right, true or false? How many people say true? So do, if, does washing your hands thoroughly before you eat infected meat alter how you would get infected? How many say people say true? How many people say false? How many people are afraid to answer? <laughs> All right, we got some honest, honest high schoolers here. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, it's, it, the, this is false. Now think about it. How does washing your hands before you eat alter if you eat something that's not cooked properly? And the answer is it doesn't. The reason I put it in, this in here is one of the nation's leading feral cat activists is publicly stating this. Okay, let's talk about pregnant mamas. Pregnant mamas can get infected one of two ways, just like the rest of us, all right? Either, either from contamination with oocysts, so if, you, if, if you've got a vegetable garden and cats are pooping out there and you're not rinsing off your vegetables well enough and you're ingesting some of that in contaminated veg, vegetables, that's how you can get it from them, okay? Or eating undercooked meat. So mamas, okay, cook your meat well, please. All right, one of the problems that we have with um, pregnant women and what they can pass on to their babies is that the babies very often have visual deficits. In addition, you don't have to be a, a baby inside your mama's womb to have, to have this parasite get in your eyes. You can just be anybody, like a golfer who's inhaling these oocysts. 
Every year in this country, there's an estimated 21,000 people who get eye infections, retinal choroiditis, from toxoplasma. And of those, 4,800 will progress to blindness. Okay, I've put some glasses out here for you because what I want to do is to give you a vicarious experience. So um, grab some, and um, if they're not right with you, then share them with a neighbor. And what I want to do here, okay, what, what this picture is, this is what a normal fundus, a normal retina, the normal back of your eye looks like. Now when we talk about, keep your glasses on for the next slide. What we're talking about here, your eye doesn't get infected by sticking your finger in cat poop and putting your finger in your eye. It doesn't, you don't get infected by getting contaminated dirt in your eye. You with me on this? You have to eat it, you get, somehow take it internally. Okay, here we go. When you look out of the left lens, that's what it looks like when you first get infected on the left side. That is what the back of your eye looks like when you're looking through the left lens. It's supposed to be fuzzy. You with me on this? The right side, when it scars down, you will have a black spot in your field of view. Now, note that I put the tachyzoites and the bradyzoites. When this infects the retina, it, this parasite goes back and forth, and these people periodically have flare-ups. So they periodically will have very awful vision until they can get it back under control and they can return it to the bradyzoite cyst phase. Who did I lose here? Everybody still with me? Okay, you all are good. All right. Social fact. I eat, live, work, and breathe in the world of free enterprise. If something I was doing as a veterinarian was causing schizophrenia or blindness, especially in children, every agency that licenses me would have me strung up by my toenails. This is a huge societal issue. Okay. I'll change the pace. This came to me a few months ago as an email, and from Paraguay, my friends, was the subject line. Now, I was a Latin nerd in high school, so I don't know Spanish. Fortunately, my son married a beautiful woman whose family is from Mexico, legally, and she translated this for me. I'll give you a minute. Can I go on? Okay. Now, the first part of this makes sense, right? The next part, and this has gone, come into our country, and there, are this, there is this discussion in feral cat activist circles about eating cat poop. Who does that? They talk about it like it's an exotic dining experience. Okay. There is a saying that to every rumor is an element of truth. And in this situation, here's the element. It's when the wee ones discover the pet doors. Now, what's on this side of that plexiglass is a litter box. And if you're this child's mama, what are you likely to say? Not my baby girl, right? So let's talk about, all right, we don't want little children in the cat box regardless, right? And we especially don't want them dabbling in the dew. But what if this child came in contact with cat poop and then licked her fingers? What, how can we know that this child would not be infected with toxoplasma? Well, one thing we know is if we're cleaning the litter box every 24 hours, it hasn't been out of the cat long enough to be infectious, right? And the other thing is, what is the cat eating? Is the cat eating anything raw? So if the cat is strictly indoors and the cat is not going outside to hunt, he's not coming in contact with the parasite outside. If the owner is feeding the cat a prepared cooked ration and the owner is not feeding a raw food diet, which has seen a resurgence in interest in the last 10 years, then the cat is not going to be infected. Does that make sense? So we don't want the little people in the box, but if it happens, okay. All right, true or false? How many people think that cats can't get infected with toxoplasma after their kittenhood? Okay, one, okay. How many people say false? We have one, how many people say false? Okay, the answer is false. And the reason I put this here is because 
an animal control director from a county in Florida is actually stating this publicly. So cats can get infected at any stage in their life. We start seeing antibody levels creep up, beginning when they leave their mamas, they get weaned, and they start to hunt on their own. But the incidence of titers in cats, positive antibodies, increase in exposure increases with age just because of the chance of encountering an animal that had bradyzoite cysts in its body. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. At any point in time, 1% of feral cats are excreting oocysts into the environment. They will, on average, excrete 20 million oocysts over about a two-week period. After five years, 55% of cats, once exposed, again, will re-excrete. Most feral cats don't excrete after two weeks because most feral cats don't live past four years of age. All right, I'm going to show you a disturbing image. If you want to avert your gaze, please do so now. All right, this is the reason that feral cats have a very short life expectancy. They die from trauma and they die from disease. Society is trading witnessed humane death by barbiturate overdose for unwitnessed traumatic deaths. If at the end of an own cat's life, I said to the owner, would you rather that I administer a humane injection of barbiturate overdose or flatten the kitty with my truck? I would cease to have a practice. All right, let's go here. All right. We need to address terminology. We cannot demonize the feral cat feeders. All right, we need to take this language out of our vocabulary. They may be central to this whole concern. The feeding of the feral cats gives the feeders an intensely positive emotional response that nothing else in their life provides. I'm gonna ask a question, but don't answer it out loud. What is the one thing in your life you hold most dear? If I threatened to take it away from you, how would you respond to me? Okay, I prefer that we use this term, allurophilia. It's appropriate, it's scientific, it's accurate, and it doesn't demonize them. Does that make sense? Okay. People have had a fondness for cats as far back as 2000 BCE, before Common Era. When I was in high school, we said BC, but it is no longer PC to acknowledge JC, so now we say BCE. Okay, anybody want to take a guess at why the Egyptians were so fond of the cats, besides the fact that they're incredibly gorgeous animals to look at? Anybody want to guess? Why did the Egyptians like the cats so much? Yes, they killed the mice, and what were the mice doing? Eating the grain, yes. Okay. What if, the, what if, what if feral cat activism today is merely this century's example of what the ancient Egyptians were doing so long ago? Okay, let me talk about the food for a minute. Because I got a call from a newspaper reporter earlier in the week, and he said, did you know that your lecture's being called the poop lecture? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'd like to also consider it the food lecture, because the whole point of this parasite may have been how the cats get fed. And that's why we need to, we, we, the, the feral cat activists need to be part of this conversation. Okay, this food, which curiously, and I didn't realize it until I was going through these slides, this came from a restaurant in New Smyrna Beach. The restaurant owner asked me to come out to his property because a feral cat feeder was feeding cats on his property without his permission. And he was afraid of confronting her for fear of coming back the next day and finding damage to his restaurant. Okay. True or false? Anybody ever had Kopi Lua coffee? Has anybody even heard of, who's heard of this? Okay, some people have heard of it. Those of you who've heard of it, have you tasted it? No, huh? no tasters yet. Okay, let me share this with you. Kopi Lua coffee, it comes from Indonesia, like the island of Java. And these civet cats, in particular the common palm civet, they live in the forest. 
And these cats sneak out of the forest, and they come onto the coffee plantations, and they eat the berries at the perfect stage of ripeness. And then the berries pass through the digestive tract and get a little digestive treatment, pass past the anal sacs and get this musky odor imparted. And then they collect the feces of the common palm civet, and they harvest the coffee beans, and they make this incredible gourmet coffee that costs $100 a cup. <clears throat> I express anal sacs as part of my job description, and I don't want any of that in my breakfast drink. But, okay. So the problem with this, and the reason I put this in here is that there is a, a recently published book in the common scientific, the, the, how should I say, out for the regular folk like us, um, press about palms, about Kofi Lua coffee being able to impart toxoplasma. No! They call it a civet cat because that's happened to be what they call it. But a civet cat is in the order the Veridae. He's not a Felidae. Does that make sense? So all Felids are cats, but not all cats are Felids. Okay? So enjoy your gourmet coffee if you would like to have it without fear of getting toxoplasma. Okay. I was asked to bring a part of my practice to this presentation. And with the owner's permission, I have brought Rupert. The signalment for this dog is that he is a six and a half year old castrated male beagle hound mix. Students, please note the punctuation. Now, I know that your English teachers are drilling into you that every sentence must have a minimum of two words, a noun and a verb. Yes, I'm getting nodding heads here. I'd like to introduce the concept that a sentence is actually a complete thought. And if you know Rupert, his name is a complete thought. People go for a walk. Dogs go for a smell, Rupert goes for a smell and a snack. And when Rupert has relieved himself of his business, his next objective is to ingest the business of the neighborhood's feral cats. Which brings us to the next point. Can dogs get toxoplasma? Well, dogs have fur, so yes, anything with feathers or fur can get it. We usually don't see it as a disease syndrome in dogs unless they're immune suppressed for some reason. And usually that immune suppression comes from distemper. Most own dogs are vaccinated against canine distemper. Everybody's still with me? So what might happen if you had a dog that, for example, was eating outside cat poop, he got infected with toxoplasma, and he had bradycytosis in his body. Then he gets infected with canine distemper, which makes the bradyzoites reactivate to tachyzoites. Everybody's still with me? Okay, and the dog succumbs, he dies, to a combined infection. This was the concept behind a study that we launched with the USDA, Dr. Doobie's lab at the USDA, and what we're looking for, this is a controlled match study, and we announced this in July of 2014. We called this the Silver Leash Project, acknowledging that owned dogs were contributing to science as man's best friend. So this is a very strictly controlled study. We're gonna be at this a while. These dogs are breed, gender, age, and geography matched. So dogs who the owners know are eating outside cat poop matched with dogs that the owners know are not eating out. Does that make sense? Are not eating outside cat poop. Okay. Nine days before we announced that, this came out in our national journal. Veterinarians have four times the suicide rate of the general population. This parasite toxoplasma is not just associated with blindness and with schizophrenia, it is also associated with suicide, and we handle cat poop as part of our job description. So approved in February, announced in May, we launched a national study also with Dr. Doobie's lab to see if veterinarians Okay, had an increased incidence of toxoplasma. So this is another, we are race, age, gender, and geography matched with physicians, MDs or DOs, also with people in the general public. Our staff also matched, our staff who handle fecal analyses, matched with physician staff who handle patients, and our clerical staff also matched with clerical physicians, staff, and also match with people in the general public. So our, we have controls, and our controls have controls. Okay, we call this the Silver Band Project. Everybody still with me? Okay, we announced so. All right, here we are in this beautiful marine environment. 
I would be remiss if I did not mention some of the marine animals that were getting diagnosed with toxoplasma. So one is the Hawaiian nene goose, and the other is the Hawaiian monk seal, and it is their infections that um, inspired a wildlife biologist in Hawaii to, prom to suggest this concept, pathogen pollution. Now, we usually think of pollution in terms of human sewage or in terms of chemicals like pesticides, but we have to acknowledge that toxoplasma is a pathogen. It is contaminating the environment. And as Dr. Martindale mentioned, the lovely California sea otter. Okay, should I be worried about these animals off the Pacific? Yeah, we all should. And I'm a veterinarian. I'm hardwired to be worried about animals. But I'm going to be very honest with you. I am more worried about what is occurring in Volusia County, particularly, with the school children. This is Horizon Elementary School, a client whose child attended that school back in the fall of 2011. This client was asked to be a parent chaperone for a fall festival. Calls me up and says, Judith, there's feral cats here. They're all over the playground, which is mostly sand, and they're coming up to the kids. I met with the principal. I went back to the school um, after hours. And you, can you see the little kitty here walking in and out? The, the hardware is absolutely no obstacle to these cats. They come on and off the campus at will. Upper left, that parking area under the pine straw, on two separate occasions, I picked up a total of 11 fecal samples, of which nine were infected with hookworms, another parasite in cat feces that cats can pass on to humans. Sadly, we didn't get any traction on this until the spring of 2013, when we found out that the homeless people in Volusia County are eating the feral cats. This picture is taken behind came, homeless camp was also a site of a feral cat colony, behind Kmart, across the street from Halifax Medical Center at the corner of Clyde Morris and International Speedway. This site was brought to my attention by another client whose office was across the street. I was a business partner for yet another client who was a teacher at Mainland High School in an allied science class, and that's how we, that's how we found out about this. I have permission to show this. This is a slide that demonstrates the locations of the homeless camps in West Volusia County. In the presence of law enforcement, I have seen eight of these camps. Seven of them were inhabited, and yes, inhabitants on all seven admitted that there were feral cats on these sites. I thought I was going to get a groundswell of support for the dire condition that the homeless people were in over this and nothing could have been farther from the truth. We have over 25 organizations in Volusia County that look after the needs of the homeless. A couple of them gave me the rah-rah, yes, yes, we need to get this out. The rest of them, mm-mm. I'm gonna paraphrase here. To some members of society, the homeless people are icky. The eating of feral cats is an icky thing, and icky people doing an icky thing is icky squared, and things that are icky squared get your funding cut. That's where we are as a society. Okay, researchers at the University of Arizona have very kindly allowed me to share this. This is confocal imaging of toxoplasma cyst. Okay, upper left, you can see this, this is a bradyzoite cyst in a mouse brain. This is way out in the neuronal process, proving that these cysts don't need to be right up next to the nucleus. In this case, it was 149 micrometers away. You could have stacked 24 red cells side by side by side between this cyst and the neuron, and what we're f neuron cell body. And what we're finding is not only does this parasite affect the cells that it's in, when it's in the brain, it affects all the other brain cells in the immediate vicinity. Okay, what if Dr. Torrey and Dr. Yolkin at Johns Hopkins are wrong? And that feels very awkward rolling off of my tongue. But what if there is no association between toxoplasma and schizophrenia? What if it's something else in the food, something else in the cat poop, something else in the soil, another parasite we have yet to discover? What if we're, they're wrong and we address this? 
And what if they're right and we don't? Because we still have these cats in, on, on, uh, across the street from, the port, from this little elementary school in Port Orange. In fact, the city of Port Orange made the Horizon Elementary Colony the first official feral cat colony of the city of Port Orange. Let me get you oriented here. You can see the school in the background. In the foreground here, let me get my pointer. Okay, in this foreground, that's a pile of cat poop right here. Can you see this? Okay. You don't have to look, hunt for these cats. Roll down your window, you can smell where they are. This little kitty was sitting under that palm tree right across the street there by that wall. And behind the wall was the feeding station. They call this Tuxedo Park because most of the cats are black and white. Reportedly, there's 15 cats in this colony. When I took this picture on a Saturday in May of 2015, at about 4.30 in the afternoon, there were only four cats there. I have no idea where the other 11 cats were. Okay, look at all this food that's left out. All right, in the afternoon, for anybody to eat, cat, raccoon, mouse, rat, whatever. I want you to note over, ah, oh, it didn't make it onto the slide. Okay, there's actually a pink dish over there, okay? Off the slide. And in that pink bowl are flies. I have seen thousands of pet food dishes in my days as a house call veterinarian. I have never seen a pet food dish of an owned animal that had flies in it. And part of the problem with having flies is that flies can carry toxoplasma. They're a transport vector. It doesn't replicate in their system, but they can carry it. And what's the nearest thing to these, this colony? is an elementary school. Okay. If there is an association between toxoplasma and schizophrenia, of course, I'm worried about elementary students, and there may, we don't know at this point. Would there be a change at the point at which you were infected? Because we have three college campuses in Volusia County that have feral cat colonies on them, and the students at Mainland High School did survey these. This is an image at UCF, the, at UCF wing of Daytona State College. Again, this is mid-morning, and look at that full bowl of food. If you look straight through that to the parking area, you would see this, a spinal column with a tail attached, thus proving once again that well-fed cats still hunt. Okay, Bethune-Cookman, this is a tradition. The feral cat colonies there are a tradition. This, is, this picture here is taken outside of one of the dorms. You can see a rodent bait trap where that trowel is. We weren't just finding cat feces, we were, we were also finding rodent pinworms. And I'm sure you're gonna say, well, wait a minute. If the cats were around, why were the rodents still around? Rodents that are infected with toxoplasma find the aroma of cat urine alluring. They're not afraid of cats if they're infected with toxoplasma. The smell of cat urine gives them a positive sexual response. Okay, and this is a photograph outside the founder's home. This is an image taken from the Embry-Riddle campus. The maintenance, the head of maintenance, knew right where to tell us to survey because the grounds keepers were complaining that when they were weeding certain areas, they were encountering feral cat poop. Now, I want you to look at this building, and I want you to look at this bird. So we were underneath this philodendron. Here we go. Okay, on this side of the philodendron. We had a student with us that day who was cleaning cages on weekends for one of the rescue organizations, who exclaims, sees this dead bird and says, window strike. And I said, hang on a minute. There was a sidewalk over here. That means the bird hit the window, meant the bird hit the window, bounced all the way over here, okay? Came underneath this philodendron. I picked the, so this is how we found the bird. I picked it up and there were puncture wounds on the other side of its neck. This sad little cuckoo. There's a saying that if we change the way we look at things, the things we look at will change. It took this three-year-old little fella all of three minutes to figure these seagulls out. He wanted so badly to offer them a piece of bread, and he kept chasing them. And within three minutes, he figured out if he just stood there, the birds would come to him. I'm going to close out by sharing with you the birds in our part of the world who have tested positive for toxoplasma. And I'm going to begin with the ring-billed gull. Also the laughing gull, the northern mockingbird, our state bird, this one, a victim of cat predation, the American robin, 
American crow. Remember what I said about flies being able to be transport vectors? Earthworms do the same thing. The parasite doesn't replicate in the earthworm, but the earthworm can carry it from one part of the ground to another. And when the birds get it, that's one way that they can get infected. Okay, also the coot. Coots are exclusively water birds. Here's this cat getting this water bird. Okay, what the cat eats, the cat will poop. If it's eating a water bird and it's pooping near the water and we've got water runoff of toxoplasma oocysts, that's how other animals are getting infected. Okay, again, red-winged blackbird. Wood duck, cattle egret, and owls, great horned owl. Okay, 25% of owls in this country when survey, survey test positive for toxoplasma. Owls tend to be resistant to the disease aspect, so they tend not to get sick with it. Please note that the, what these owls are hunting. Owls are native predators. Cats are non-native predators. Barred owl, I liked this picture because this to me is what hunger looks like. And people have said to me, well, why don't you just explain to the homeless people that they shouldn't eat the feral cats because it may give them a mental illness in who knows how many years, six or seven years down the road. Hunger is a need that requires satiation right this moment. Okay, for a homeless person, seven years in the future just doesn't exist for them. Barn owl. Rock pigeons. Rock pigeons are a species of least concern. That said, they are one of the most susceptible species to toxoplasma. 10 oocysts is a fatal dose for a rock pigeon. It causes an intensive intestinal inflammation. Turkey vultures. An interesting thing about this parasite, those bradyzoite cysts, those remain infectious after the carcass has liquefied and autolyzed. Wild turkeys, into the raptors, the kestrel. Cooper's hawk, this photographer was very kind, offered me a, a, a number of pictures to choose from, and I chose this one because this is how I usually see this bird. These birds are death on the wing, and they are, they're usually a blur. And their preferred food are songbirds, which that's kind of hard for, for, for those of us who really love birds to think birds eating birds, but that's what they do. These are native predators. Cats are non-native predators. Red shoulder hawk, red tailed hawk, and the bald eagle. Toxoplasma gondii causes inflammation of the heart. Fatal myocarditis in our nation's symbol. If we change the way we look at things, the things we look at will change. Let us change the way we look at mental illness and let us change the way we look at outside cats. I'd like to thank Dr. Duby for his support for these studies, also for my colleague in Wisconsin, where it not for her, the, the canine study wouldn't have come to fruition and the human study was her idea. All of these entities and people were instrumental, were it not for a single one of, every one of them, I wouldn't be here tonight. And I hope that I got the point across that this concern has been client driven and I am immensely gra grateful to my clients. Thank you all for being here. I'm grateful and I welcome your questions. Mm. Before some of you leave, if I could ask a, if I could ask a favor. Um, I'm often asked to do bullet points for presentations and, and Jesse Grosso, Grosso Garcia um, has those by email, so if you'd like, a, um, if any of this information you'd like to see in print, she has a copy of that. The other thing is, is that I am still on a huge learning curve where this is concerned. And Dr. Martindale was kind enough to let me prepare a survey. It's anonymous. They're self-addressed stomped envelopes. I would be very grateful to you if you would fill them out and mail them back to me. Okay, questions. Yes. I'll, I'll start. Yes, I've got sir. two questions. Yes, I'll sir. try to keep them very brief so okay. you can get to both of them. The first one is, I'm a dietitian, oh. a food service dietitian. Okay. And the current recommendation for pork is to cook to 145 degrees. And I think that may be because of the fear for, um, you know, the uh, trichinosis. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, is 145 degrees safe or not? You have to cook to 160 degrees to kill Toxoplasma bradyzoites. Yeah, is, is, it, is it an issue in commercially grown pork? Okay, so the question in, is, and this is your first, the, do you want to that, ask the second one? Is, is it a tandem that I could answer no, it's both? No, it's not a tandem. Okay, so hold, hold on the microphone. Question. Let me address that because that's important. Pork, as you saw on the slide, 
um, is, is the uh, meat of greatest concern in this country. 3% of pork is infected with toxoplasma. I have had pork producers come up and whisper in my ear, yeah, that's why we don't allow cats in the farrowing house. It is possible to produce toxoplasma-free, free-range pork. Intensely labor-intensive, because you have to keep the cats out of the way and you have to keep rodents away. But yes, pork is a concern in this country. 3% of it is infected. So 160 degrees is the requirement to kill toxoplasma. Okay, thank you. Next second, question. second question, and it has to do with the feral cat population. Yes, sir. We visited a clinic, a veterinary clinic in uh, Clay County, just this week, and we overheard a woman uh, at the desk say that, yeah, you can bring a feral cat in on Wednesday morning, but we restrict our um, uh, spay and neutering to the first 50 cats. And, and we asked her later, did we hear you correctly, 50 cats or 15? And she said, no, we do 50 cats a week. Is spaying and neutering cats and then releasing them back into the wild an appropriate that's the concern. So cats that are minus their gonads, that have had their ovaries and their testes removed, are equally competent at spreading toxoplasm in the environment as cats that still have their gonads. So where this parasite, it's, it stops that cat from reproducing. And let me just address the whole, that, that issue. Okay, you have to spay neuter 70, 70% of cats to keep the population at the present level. That's the fecundity rate of the cat. At best, areas are spay-neutering 10%. And what they want of us to focus on is to say, well, that ten, those 10% of the animals, they're not going to reproduce. OK, I'll buy that. The other 90% are out there still reproducing. And the 10% that you return to the environment are still spreading toxoplasmosis. Did that answer your question? OK. OK. Yes, question? I'll repeat it. Okay. In the one slide you showed the, the garden with the... Uh, uh -huh. In the one slide you showed the garden with the uh, cat feces around the plants. Now, does that to Toxoplasma Gandhi... Gandhi... Gandhi I? <laughs> Gandhi I. Say it with me, Gandhi I. Gandhi I. Thank you. Uh, now, does that strictly by contact, or can that be systemic in the plants? You have to ingest it. It has to get inside you. That's no, a good but point. I mean, from the, to be have the plants be. Oh, 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 oh. Does it get into? Does it get taken up into the plant? So the question is, does it? The, is it on the outside of the plants, or does it get taken up into the plant system? Through the root system. And through the root system, it's a very good question. <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. So no, it stays on the outside. It doesn't get sucked up into the plant. So if you thoroughly wash the vegetables. You're good. If there's, if there's nothing left on the vegetables to wash off the oasis that might be there, you're, it doesn't get in, it's right, it's not in the inside of the plant. Very good question. Next. Um, Dr. Oh, Martin. you're going to ask Hello. me, can I introduce you? Sure. sure. Okay, this is Dr. Okay. Duma. Um, I'm vice president of his fan club because his wife is next to him as president. Um, <laughs> he's a, He's an infectious disease yeah. expert, and um, he was very instrumental at, at, at helping me decipher a failed rabies quarantine with one of my clients several years ago, and I'm still indebted to him for that. So go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered, but actually, I thought that was a wonderful uh, talk you gave. I'm okay. sure everyone really appreciates it. Thank you. it it's, uh, it's too bad that the entire public in the country couldn't be here to hear it. it it's amazing how little the public knows uh, about animals and about their contact. And I think when we mentioned earlier One Health and veterinarians and physicians uh, should be getting together more frequently and understanding these diseases that we have to encounter. Um, th there are an enormous number uh, of diseases, as you know, uh, that are zoonotic. And that uh, they, it's been said that anywhere from, at least in the medical community, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of uh, people who get infectious diseases have had experience with organisms that were transmitted from animals. And there's, there's a, a real lack of understanding and uh, taking time to try to understand what it means when you have close contact with animals. I don't care what sort of animal it might be. They all carry various pathogens, uh, and many of them can produce very serious diseases in humans. 
And I think uh, that sort of is sort of an expansion of what you said earlier in terms of cats. Uh, we, we often, too, are facing diseases uh, that are pathogens in cats that are something other than tox toxoplasma. But there are many other different pathogens in other animals. And I think that's something that we really have to somehow get out to the public to understand this and, and recognize what's going on and to pay attention to animals and any kind of close contact they or their families might have with animals. But again, uh, enjoyed your Thank discussion you. immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. You mentioned mice are attracted to cat urine. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm looking, I'm looking for said, the person who's asking it. You, you oh, wait, <laughs> okay. Here. Yes, sir. Okay. You mentioned mice are attracted to cat yes, urine. Well, humans that are infected, males are also attracted to cat urine, females not. Now, females have more uh, suicide, as you mentioned, about three times as much, and they use male methods. They, they shoot themselves. They don't use pills. They use male methods. But that's interesting also. Okay. There, there, there's a lot in the literature. Um, Dr. Tori and Dr. Yolkin at the Stanley Medical Research Institute, you can Google this, have an entire website dedicated to this association between toxoplasmosis and schizophrenia. And also, Dr. Yaroslav Flager, he's an evolutionary biologist in the Czech Republic, has done a tremendous amount of work on this. So um, it kind of adds, adds to what you were just saying. Question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Should we, does, does someone have a microphone that I'm stepping over here? I'm sorry. Can, can I get her and then I'll get you? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, is Toxoplasma gondii affected by freezing? Oh, good question. Okay, the question, is Toxoplasma gondii affected by freezing? Technically, you have to hold meat at 12 degrees Fahrenheit for seven consecutive days before you are assured that you are going to, uh, how should I say, render the bradyzoites non-infectious. But let me say this, for the housewife, who has a chicken that she gets at the grocery store and she sticks it into her freezer where there's no other meat in the freezer and she takes that out the next day. It completely freezes by itself, takes it out the next day. In all likelihood, that meat will be safe to eat. However, when we take people who are feeding, let's say they've got a lot of animals, right, and they fill an empty freezer and they stuff it full of meat, Okay, the meat that's right in the middle, that is not going to see freezing temperatures for a number. Do you, you see the difference here? So I can't tell you, I can only tell you that we know that 12 degrees Fahrenheit after seven days will assuredly affect it. Now, let, can I address a little more, go on a little tangent here? There's salting, there's pickling, you know what I mean? There's different methods of handling meat. In a lot of cases, salting does render the bradyzoites non-infectious, but there are no standardized salting techniques, so we can't make a blanket statement about that. We still recommend that you cook the meat 260. Did that answer the question? Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so she, she has uh, a question. Yes. yes. Um, so I wanted to ask about the antibodies. So mm -hmm. you have these, people could have antibodies, they've been exposed to the Toxoplasma gondii. Are they able then to fight it off and destroy it? And um, if so, what are the percentage that do and what are the percentage that don't? Do you, is it immunocompromised people that end up getting it? Okay, it's an excellent question. So the question is, if you have antibodies, are you able to fight it off or what happens? If you have antibodies, that means you have bradyzoite cysts somewhere in your body. If you are able to hold that in check, if your immune system is competent, you won't have a problem. But what happens if you get cancer and you have to be treated with chemotherapy? What happens if you're a transplant patient and you're treated with anti-rejection drug? Do you see what I'm saying? So there's all these, what happens if you get another illness that renders you, your immune system weak? Let's take AIDS patients, for example. 10% of AIDS patients die because of toxoplasmosis. Okay, that's, that, does that answer your question? It was a very good one. It, okay. it does, okay. and uh, so if that happens, is there something you can take to destroy the, the so, Toxoplasma gondii in your body? So if it's in an active form, that's where that drug Daraprim came, comes in. It's a sulfa drug. There is a treatment for this. Um, Dr. Duma, if you want to weigh in here, you're welcome to. Um, and, 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 and so, yes, there's a treatment if it's in an active form. We can't get out the bradyzoite cysts. We, we don't have anything right now to, to kill them. But we can get it when it's in the tachyzoite form. Did, did they answer the question? 
Yes, okay. and my last question, and I hate to monopolize it, but the, I'm very interested in the Schizophrenia yeah. Association. So what kind of testing are they doing with schizophrenics? Are they looking we're, we're way documenting on, it? I'm gonna, we're way on the leading edge of this. Dr. Tori and Dr. Yolkin have led this country. There are now over 45 researchers worldwide who've been looking at this for a decade. So the evidence is, is building for that. Um, it's, the, the issue is, is that the temporal relationship. So let's take rabies, for example. Most people know, okay, with the exception of bats, but most people, let's say you got bitten by a raccoon or a feral cat, okay? You would know when you got bitten, right? And within two weeks, roughly, okay, it could be 18 months, but it, it, it's a time factor. You know that you're gonna develop symptoms, okay? It's, it's farther out with that, with toxoplasma and schizophrenia, okay? The temporal relationship. And then you have this whole thing about eating meat. Do you see what I'm saying? So while it all originated from cat feces, where you got it, you can't be sure. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Thank next, you. Next question. Okay, yes? Do I, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Um, if, we, if you have a dog that is well managed with their health, like okay. a, a year old puppy or whatever, right. and then you have a new baby come into the house, is it detrimental for that puppy to be in the face of that new baby. Are we talking about with respect to toxoplasma? No, with anything. With, oh. I mean, because I thought like, like um, my, the pediatricians and veterinarians say that you can't transfer between species anything that the dog has if they're licking the baby. Or, so well, I didn't know if that's safe or not. For, the question is about, right, so you mentioned dogs, so I have part A and part B to answers to that. Okay, dogs use their tongue as toilet paper. Okay, so I, I really, I mean, while as sweet as it is to get kissed by a dog, I really don't recommend that, especially for, for babies and small children. Okay, number two, about dogs and toxoplasma. The parasite does not replicate in the dog intestine, but the dog can act as a transport host. So it passes through the dog's system. So a dog who it may live in a fenced-in yard can be out you know, on, a, on for walks eating feral cat poop, come in and transplant that parasite and contaminate his family's yard. Does that make sense? Okay, it doesn't replicate in the dog intestine, but the dog can act as a transport host. Thank you, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, thank you, it was a good one. Who's yeah. next? Yes, sir. Oh, that's a good question. Is this more of a problem of temperate climates? So we do find toxoplasma on all seven continents on the planet. Um, that said, we tend to see more diseases, and Dr. Duma may weigh in here, um, in, in, in the, how should I say, more temperate zones. So let me, let me just address South America here and, and where we are in Florida. So we have three strains of toxoplasma in the United States and less than 3% of people who get infected develop eye disease. In South America, there's over 20 strains of the parasite. They occur concurrently, and upwards of 30% of the people who get infected develop eye lesions. The concern for Florida is our proximity to South America, and the worry is if we start seeing some of these strains come in North, Florida's gonna be the first state to um, recognize that. Did I answer your question? Well, well, to your, to your, yes. So, do you want to answer this, Dr. Duma? I, I didn't quite get he, the, the question. Is if you were in a colder climate, would you see less incidence of toxoplasma than if you were in a warmer climate? I, I would suspect not. But honestly, I, I think you would. Uh, it would depend. There are a lot of warm bodies around. There are a lot of warm animals around. Uh, they're not all dying just because of the temperature okay. where they might be. But again. In, in the very cold areas, you're going to have many people and many animals close together. Okay. Uh, this is a very common event in Alaska and places of that sort. Okay. People don't just uh, ignore having an animal, either a cat or a dog or whatever, sleeping with them. And they're all over the place. So I, I just don't think it is that important. Um, to, your, to your points, thank you. To your point, sir, this is one of the questions we hope to answer in the veterinary human study because we are tracking these people both from birth to age 10 and also where they spent more than half of their time since age 21. So we are hoping that when we get a look at the big picture, will we see a difference in incidence 
for people who lived in the northern parts of the country versus people who lived this. But it's a, it's a good question and, and, and one we are addressing. Anybody else? Yes? Uh huh. Um, you said that toxoplasma um, grows in the small intestine. Yes. And then you were talking about how sometimes it'll appear in the eyes or in the brain cells. Yes. But when you said that it can't travel through red blood cells, yes. how would it travel up to your eyes or to your brain? Through, through the blood or lymphatic. So the question is, how does it get there? If it, if it, if it developed in the cabinet, so you, you swallow it, it, goes, it migrates through the small intestine and gets picked up by the blood or the, or the lymphatics. Or it may travel just like creepy, creepy, creepy into another organ in the abdominal cavity. So then it also like affects your whole body basically when it, can, it travels? It can go in anywhere your blood or lymph can go, toxoplasma can get taken there. So anything that you could eat, any cis organ that you could eat has the potential to be infected with toxoplasma. It's a good question. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. Uh, you know, there was a, the question came up. About, oh, I'm sorry. About, I, I, I'm sorry about the The drugs. gentleman in blue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, about the drugs that might be used, uh, pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, yes. are drugs that are often used and occasionally clindamycin. And with someone with HIV uh, or some profound immune suppressive problem, uh, they're just not going to survive. They're going to have to take those drugs continuously forever. And many times those drugs are associated with a number of adverse effects. And when you get to... Uh, to infants and uh, children of that sort, you, you really bump into a lot of problems. You can't handle this disease very easily. It doesn't always simply uh, get uh, responded, rather, uh, uh, when you have to use these drugs, uh, even though you would hope that the disease would be cleared up right away. Not always the case at all. That, that speaks to your question. Okay, thank you, thank you. The gentleman in blue, yes, sir. Yes. Do mosquitoes play any role in the spread of Toxoplasma. So the question is, do mosquitoes play a role in the spread of toxoplasma? We don't think so. That's okay. a good question. But let me just address this. Um, blood transfusions, there's, there's a question mark. And organ transplants, the recommendation, is, okay, so they're supposed to send a vial of blood to test for toxoplasma. That's the recommendation. But there is no requirement on the receiving end. So if you are in a time crunch, and they have to get that organ into the recipient. They're gonna, they're gonna go ahead and, and give them the transplant without testing. Does that make sense? So to your question about immune suppression, there's two problems with regards to people who are getting organ transplants. One is if they already had bradyzoite cysts in their system and they have to take immunosuppressive drugs so that they don't reject the organ they're receiving, that can make the disease manifest. And 7 to 20 percent of the people in the United States have cysts in their system. The other thing is, is that what if you were the organ donor and you had those cysts in the organ that you were donating, okay? And then it got transplanted into some. So, so I hope that addresses two questions here. Okay. So a concern, yes. We're not sure how much. Uh, once a person gets infected and uh, they show some symptoms, they, uh, I'm sorry, who's, I'm, I'm losing, oh, there we are, thank you, thank do, you. Do they have a problem when they go to their internist or the eye person or whatever to get misdiagnosed? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand I'm the wondering question. if they, once you've developed symptoms, you get sick because you've been infected with it. Does the doctors have problems diagnosing the correct Okay, so the question illness? is, do doctors have a um, problem diagnosing toxoplasma? So yes. I'll answer, let me address the eyes. Okay. So these slides were provided by the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I was very grateful for that, and I did ask them that question. They said that those lesions in the eye are, how should I say, emblematic. They, they absolutely are pathognomonic. They know what toxoplasma looks like. They will probably do serology on that patient just to, as an assurance factor, but they know what toxoplasma looks like. As far as other diseases, I'm going to hand that back to the infectious disease expert and say, how, you know, when you get presented with a um, ain't doing right patient, fever of unknown origin, how often are you looking for toxoplasma? <laughs> well, not that often. Okay. And it's uh, impressive how uh, little actually most physicians know about toxoplasma and are uh, uh, ready to uh, make the diagnosis. Even many people who are ophthalmologists, it's something they don't necessarily think about all the time and uh, are not necessarily willing to get the serology done that you have to do. And if you did do the test, if it happened the event recently, it might take uh, several weeks before actually the antibodies begin to appear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it, 
I would say that the vast majority of physicians really don't know much about toxoplasmas. Can I, can I just address this for a minute? A cardiologist made a comment to me a couple of months ago, and he said, we don't know how many babies are being lost through miscarriage because of toxoplasma because we're not testing the moms for it. If a mama loses her baby to miscarriage, we pat her on the back, say, I'm so sorry this happened to you. I hope the rest of your life goes better. We don't know how many babies are being lost through miscarriage because of this parasite. Yes, ma'am. Oh. oh. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, is it like only associated with schizophrenia or is it also associated with like other diseases and um, how is, what role did like the sex offender slide play in it because I didn't really understand. Okay. Oh, she just opened the big can of worms. Okay. <laughs> is it associated with other diseases? So I'm going to, I know I know you're trying to wrap up, but Mr. Sensi, when's your bedtime? Um, okay. So um, here's, so here's the, this, it's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. It is associated with schizophrenia. It is associated with a psychotic form of bipolar disorder. They think it's associated with Alzheimer's disease. And I know someone at NIH who wanted to study this, the association with Alzheimer's, okay? Alzheimer's is also associated with a few other things, cytomegalovirus, you know what I mean? There's herpes simplex, there's other things that are associated. I'm gonna go off on a tangent here, but I'll come back to that. My prediction, just as a house call vet in Daytona Beach, is in 50 years, schizophrenia will be a symptom. It will not be a diagnosis. Because what we're finding is that the body only has so many ways to respond to something, okay? And this may just be a symptom. Back to your question. I have clients that live in a very nice, a number of clients in a beautiful neighborhood that's designated 55 and over. In private conversation, I said, what do you think are the chances, and they have feral, feral cat problem in this neighborhood, what do you think are the chances that this neighborhood might wish to be included in an NIH study? They could not get away from me fast enough. Because, think about it, for that age group, okay, Alzheimer's, it's like what leprosy was a century ago, okay? It's a fear. They wanted desperately to know the answer. Is there an association with feral cat feces and toxoplasma and Alzheimer's? They want desperately to know that answer, but they wanted no part in being a part of any NIH study. Okay, so that's being looked at. It's a beautiful, who's your teacher? Is your teacher here? No, she left. She oh, was here. bummer. <laughs> All right, somebody vouched for her extra, extra credit points when she goes back to school. Okay, was that it? Okay, thank you. Thank you, you've been wonderful. Appreciate you. <laughs>